everybody, welcome back to chemistry. And so now we're in chapter three, which is a description of ionic compounds. And so first I want to increase this slide and talk a little bit about what compounds are. And so you might recall a compound is a molecule that has two different kinds of elements bound together. And one of the things you're gonna learn is that there are two different kinds of compounds. There are ionic compounds and there are molecular compounds. And so one of the things you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to eventually look at a compound name or formula and figure out whether it's an ionic compound or molecular compound. So let me just give you a couple of quick examples. So let's say you see a name of a compound like this. It is dinitrogen pentoxide. So I can look at this name and sort of tell you that this is not an ionic compound, this is a molecular compound. So let's say I give you a formula like this, CaCO3. I can look at this formula and tell you that this is an ionic compound and not a molecular compound. Again, eventually I'll show you how to do that in a couple of slides from now. First, we need to go over some basic explanation as to the differences between ionic compounds and molecular compounds. So if you sort of look at the left portion here of the slide, here I have a description of a particular ionic compound called sodium chloride. So there it is, and its formula is that, it's NaCl. So you have ionic compounds when you have ions binding together to form a very large molecule. So let me take a moment to explain that. So here we have a picture of one molecule of sodium chloride on the left. So you see that purple atom there, that is actually sodium. And so this is actually not a neutral atom here. This is a ion. So I'm gonna indicate this by putting a plus here into this atom. Now, to the left of that, we have that green atom. The green atom is a, not an atom, but an ion. It is a chloride ion, but here the ion is not positive, it is negative. So I'm gonna put a negative like that. So let me again just remind you that the one on the left is a sodium ion, and the one on the right is a chloride ion. So the reason why these ions stick together is because you can see that they're oppositely charged. So the sodium ion has a plus, the chloride ion has a negative. And so this really has an important implication. What you can imagine is if there are a lot of these ions around, guess what's gonna happen? They are all going to stick together. They're going to clump together. So you have tons and tons of tons of these positive negative ions stuck together to form a single sodium chloride crystal. But there's one thing that all these sodium chloride crystals in, have in common. You can bet that for every positive sodium ion in the crystal, you will find a complementary negative chloride ion. Now it could be that it's a small crystal and maybe it only has like say 502 sodium positive ions and 502 chloride negative ions. It may be a larger crystal, say maybe having like 1,532,000 sodium positive ions, but again, a complementary number of negative chloride ions, 1,532,000 chloride ions. And so another very important thing that you need to understand is that these ions are stuck together and so that portion there where they're stuck together, I'm kind of drawing, writing that out there, this is called an ionic bond. Okay, now on the right side here, what we have are compounds that are not considered to be ionic compounds, instead they are molecular compounds. And so and a great example of a molecular compound is water. And so there is good old water, its formula is H2O. We have that nice picture of water there. And you can see we have a red oxygen atom and it's bound to white hydrogen atoms. And there are two white hydrogen atoms bound to the oxygen atom. But here's a very important difference between molecular compounds and ionic compounds. With ionic compounds, you have ions that are created and they are all stuck together. 
in molecular compounds, you do not have ions. In fact, these are neutral atoms and in some fashion that they stick together. And so if you have a molecular compound here and you're looking at each of the bonds here from oxygen to hydrogen, this bond here that connects oxygen to hydrogen is called a covalent bond. And so that is something that you need to understand. Okay, now there's a big difference between how ionic compounds aggregate together and what molecular compounds do. So you might remember that really when you're looking at an ionic crystal, you're seeing zillions and zillions and zillions of ions stuck together. How about if you're looking at a beaker of water, do you see zillions and zillions and zillions of water molecules stuck together? And the answer is no. Here, this is sort of a nice picture was going on in liquid water, and that in, in fact, the water molecules are separated from one another some distance away from each other. And if it's liquid water, these molecules, they are a little bit separated from one another, but they are moving around each other. Okay, so now what I need to do is I need to talk a little bit about the mechanism of how you form ionic compounds and molecular compounds. And so now if I can reduce the slide. Okay, so a very important question to ask is, how do you take elements in the periodic table which are represented as neutral elements and take them and form ions? And how do those ions bind together to form an ionic compound? So I'm gonna talk about that right now. So again, we're gonna be looking at ionic compounds. And so the example here is sodium chloride. And so its formula is NaCl. And one of the things you're gonna learn is that the way you create ions from neutral atoms is through something called electron transfer. So I'm gonna write electron transfer. And when that happens, then you can get the ions to bind together, and then where they bind together, you have an ionic bond. So I need to show you this process where you take neutral atoms in the periodic table, there's some kind of transfer of one or more electrons from one atom to the other so that you can form positive negatively charged ions. And so the best way to describe this is with sodium chloride. That is a really good example to look at. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write out some electron configurations of sodium chloride right now. Okay, so with sodium, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use a red pen. So sodium here, you might look it up in the periodic table and you see that it has 11 electrons. And so now I'm just gonna write out its configuration. I'm hoping you can figure that out on your own. It looks like this, two electrons in 1s, two electrons in 2s, and then we have the 2p sublevel with three different orbitals. And these are all filled with electrons. And then finally, the last electron in neutral sodium um, is in 3s, and there's one like that, okay? So chlorine, what we're gonna do is we look up chlorine's location in the periodic table and you see it has an atomic number of 17, so it has 17 electrons, so we need to write out its orbital configuration. So it's like this. I'm hoping you can do this on your own. Okay, so I have completed the electron configurations for the neutral sodium and chlorine atoms. And so now what I wanna do is I wanna describe how you have electron transfer from one atom to another to create ions. And so there are two possibilities. So what could happen is this single electron in 3S sublevel of sodium can leave it and go to the chlorine and it, there's a place for it in chlorine. You can see that this 3P sublevel could accept one more of a, an electron from sodium. And so you could put that there if you wanted to. But there is another possibility. The other possibility, you see the single electron around chlorine here at the 3P sublevel. It's possible that this electron could leave chlorine and then it could go into sodium's 3S sublevel and pair up with this electron. So how do you figure out which one is going on? Well, there's actually some useful information that we've already learned about that kind of tells you which direction it's going. And so that is the ionization energy of these electrons. 
So you can look up the ionization energy for sodium's electron, and it is 496 kilocalories per mole, but we're not gonna really worry about the units. But here, the ionization energy for chlorine's electron here is about three times as much. It's 1,251 kcals per mole. So what that tells you right now is that you don't need too much energy to get this electron off sodium and transferred to chlorine. You're gonna need a lot more energy to transfer chlorine's electron to sodium. So in fact, what happens, because it's easier, what's going to happen is this electron here is going to leave sodium and transfer to chlorine. And so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna write out the electron configurations of these atoms after you have the electron transfer. So I'll get back with you in just a minute and then we'll explain what's going on here. Okay, so now what I've done is I've drawn out the correct electron configurations of these atoms after you have an electron leaving sodium and that sodium's electron is now with chlorine. So now what I wanna do is to count how many electrons we have in each of these atoms now. And so with sodium, we start out with 11 electrons, and now you can see we're missing one. We are now down to 10 electrons. Now let's think about the implications of that. Well, this is still a sodium atom. Sodium still has 11 protons, 11 positive charges in its nucleus, but now we have 10 electrons or 10 negative charges. And so these 10 negative charges can only neutralize 10 of the 11 positive charges. That means there's one extra positive charge in sodium that cannot be neutralized. So this sodium atom is really now something new. It is called an ion. If it has a extra positive charge or more than one positive charge, it is called a cation. We'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, but to indicate that this is now a cation, I'm gonna put a plus here. All right, let's talk about what happened to chlorine here. With chlorine, it started out with 17 electrons, and now you can see after this process has occurred, we have added one more electron from sodium, and so now we have a total of 18 electrons here. All right, now let's count up charges with this species of chlorine. So it's still a chlorine atom, so it still has an atomic number of 17 with 17 protons and 17 positive charges, but now we have 18 electrons or 18 negative charges, and you can sort of see that basically we have an extra negative charge on this atom. It is no longer an atom because it has an extra negative charge. It is an ion, but whenever you have an ion with extra negative charges, they're called anions. We'll talk more about this later. So this has a single extra negative charge, so we put a negative charge like that. But there's also something very important here that you need to see. Look at the sodium ion configuration here, and it's really kind of striking, and the reason is this. Sodium ion is now down to 10 electrons, and so basically its configuration is now 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. And so what this is is actually neon's electron configuration. So this is striking. We have a sodium atom because it has 11 protons, but with neon's electron configuration, there are only 10 electrons here. So when sodium loses its electron and becomes a positively charged ion, it gets a neon or noble gas configuration. And noble gas configurations, as maybe we learned, or maybe we talked a little bit about before, and we might talk more about them in the future, are very stable. Atoms like to have noble gas configuration. And so when sodium loses its electron becomes positive charged, it is happy. It becomes a stable noble gas configuration. Now let's look at the chlorine atom after it picks up an electron and gets a negative charge. Let's look at its configurations. It is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. That's it. So if you look at this configuration, you will see now that it has 18 electrons, 
which is argon's electron configuration. So you have a chlorine atom here, but with argon's electron configuration. You may recall that argon is a noble gas. So when chlorine picked up that extra electron from sodium, it got happy too, because now it also has a noble gas configuration. So now I think you can see now why electrons are being transferred um, between these atoms here is because if they're transferred in the right way, they can either lose or gain electrons to achieve a noble gas configuration and therefore will be very stable. Okay, one more thing I wanna kinda of quickly point out is that there's another way you can describe what has happened here. And so we can do this with electron dot pictures. And so I wanna do that really quickly. And so what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna draw a picture of a neutral sodium atom. And so here I have the symbol for sodium here, and we're trying to figure out how many dots it has. And so again, we're looking at the neutral sodium atom, and you can see there are three energy levels. We look at the number of electrons in the numerically highest energy level, and we see that there's only one electron in the third energy level. So sodium has one dot, right? Okay, so let's draw a dot picture of chlorine. So chlorine um, has a total of 17 electrons, but you can see its highest energy level is the third, and it has seven electrons in its highest energy level. So there are gonna be seven dots like that. Okay, so sodium, because it has one electron at its highest energy level, has one valence electron as indicated by one dot. Chlorine has seven valence electrons as indicated by seven dots. Okay, so what is going to happen is that this electron here, you know, will leave sodium and go to chlorine. So let's write this out now after the transfer. It looks like this. We have sodium here and it's the symbol and it's lost its electron, but we have to indicate it's no longer a neutral atom, and so we put a positive charge like that. So what does chlorine look like? Chlorine has its seven dots like this. I'm drawing axis just to show chlorine's electrons that distinguish them from sodium's electrons, and now sodium electron is here, right? But chlorine is now no longer a neutral atom it has an extra electron, so this is a negative charge. So the way I think about it is like this. You have here a sodium ion. Sodium ions are relatively small, so I'm gonna write Na plus here. And then we have here a chloride ion. Chloride ions are relatively large, and so I'm gonna write Cl minus here. And again, these ions just stick together like this. And so what we have now is a sodium chloride molecule. But again, what will happen is if there are a lot of these ions around, they're just gonna all stick together. So we're gonna get another sodium ion here, another chloride ion here, and so on and so on. So this just goes on ad infinitum until you recapitulate a huge sodium chloride crystal. So this describes the process of electron transfer that goes on in an ion compound. So let me erase this really quickly, and I'll get back with you. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is take a brief look at molecular compounds and see how they differ from ionic compounds. And so the example we're gonna be looking at is water, and you know its formula is H2O. And what you're gonna see is that the atoms here in the water molecule are really not ions. They are still considered to be neutral atoms. When you have neutral atoms binding together, it's usually because the electrons are being shared between the different atoms in the bond. And so when you have a bond where you don't have electron transfer like you see in ion compounds, but something called electron sharing, this is called a covalent bond. So I'm gonna quickly explain this. I might do a little bit more later. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write out an electron configuration for oxygen and two hydrogens, and I'll get back with you. Okay, so what I've done is I've written out the electron configuration for oxygen, and you can see oxygen's eight electrons here. 
And then I have one hydrogen down here with its one electron and another hydrogen up here with its one electron. So the first question you might ask is, is it possible for an electron to be leaving oxygen and be completely transferred to hydrogen for it to stay there? Or the opposite, is it possible for an electron to leave hydrogen forever and go to oxygen and stay there? In other words, can you have electron transfer between oxygen and hydrogen? The answer is no. And the reason is, is because you can figure out that the ionization energies for oxygen and hydrogen are really high. So for example, the ionization energy for that oxygen electron there is 1,313 kilocalories per, per mole. And then for this hydrogen electron here, it's about as high as 1,013 and 12 kilocalories per mole. So you really need a lot of energy to transfer one of these electrons to the other atom, and the energy is not readily available. So we have a problem here. So how do we get these atoms to stick together? Well, the atoms do it by a trick called electron sharing. So let me show you how this is done. So let me erase this information here. So let's just consider here, um, a bond that forms between here, this 2p orbital in oxygen and the 1s orbital here in hydrogen. And so what happens is this. Again, you cannot have transfer of this oxygen electron to hydrogen nor hydrogen electrons to oxygen. So instead, what happens is oxygen electron is always moving around. Spend some time with hydrogen, goes back to itself. <laughs> Spend some time to hydrogen and go back to itself. So it's wandering back and forth. So you can see that this electron here is being shared between the two atoms. And the same thing with this electron here in hydrogen. It doesn't go completely transfer over to oxygen. It goes here for some time, goes back to hydrogen, goes to oxygen back, back and forth, back and forth. So these two electrons here are being shared by the atoms. And so, what this is able to do by sharing these electrons here, um, back and forth, back and forth, this allows each atom to get toward a noble gas configuration. So when you briefly have oxygen's electrons here in hydrogen, you have helium's noble gas configuration. If you have hydrogen's electron here with oxygen, and this hydrogen's electron of oxygen for a moment, you achieve a neon noble gas configuration. So you can sort of be, in a way, achieve noble gas configuration by this process of electron sharing. So I indicate electron sharing by putting a box between the orbitals of the different atoms that are sharing these electrons. And so we have the other oxygen-hydrogen bond is occurred by sharing of these electrons here in these two orbitals. And so Let's draw an draw, electron dot picture of what's going on. Kind of looks like this. We have oxygen here. And to start with, we have six valence electrons like this. And then what we have is two hydrogen atoms like this, each with their valence electron. And so what we can do is indicate how water forms. It looks like this. So we have oxygen here with its six valence electrons. And then stuck to it, you have a hydrogen. But here, you just sort of have to remember that this pair of electrons here is not like transferred to one particular atom or the other. This pair of electrons is being shared between this oxygen atom and the hydrogen atom. If that's the case, then these atoms have no charge. Same thing with the electrons here between this oxygen and hydrogen. There's gonna be no charge between those atoms. And so this is said to be neutral atoms in this molecule and a neutral compound. And again, what you have to remember is these bonds here, which I've described, like this one here is that one, and this one is this one. You have to remember that these are called covalent bonds. Okay. So I'm going to erase the board, and I'll get back with you.